to zoto brane we thank you kadeke boja de we thank you ma keke to zoto brane de ke boja ta ma brozoto ma brozoto ke tu se keke de ke broko to se ke te baba ma tri de ke boje keke ti ka pranda karaba ma ndo reke se ke te ke tu se ke te brane ma tu se ke to prande ke ruka da ka zaka da prande ke de ke ze ke te ke zoto brane da ka baba ba ma tri de ke he ke ndo li he ke ndo li he ke ndo ni ke tu se ke prane de re de ke ba ma tri de ke bo ja ka te ke ma ka re ke he ke tu se comprane de ke prane da ka ba he ko do so to prane ke ke do se kanta prane de ke bo ja da he ke do sa ka te ke te ke te ma tri de ke bo ja ka te thank you lord we give you holy ghost we give you praise lord we give you praise lord we give you praise we give you praise thank you for utterance lande le ke bo janda thank you for utterance makoto se ke te thank you for utterance keto so to prane de ke ja kade ke se kade ke se makato so ko prane de ke thank you daddy in jesus name we pray lord we thank you we ask you speak to us again tonight we ask you open the pages of scriptures we ask you illuminate our spirits we ask you educate our minds we ask you shed some light into our souls thank you precious lord in jesus mighty name we pray can i have a louder amen put your hands together for jesus and have your sin in god's presence hallelujah yeah yeah thank you very much for that swelling moment in praying in the holy ghost it's always important to pray in the holy ghost wow i didn't even realize that somebody would stimulate that tonight I hope that we're going to speak about that. You know, people don't know that when you do that, the Bible says in Romans chapter 8 verse 26, it says to us clearly, likewise, the Spirit helps our infirmities. 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 It says because we do not know what we should pray for as we ought to pray. But it says the Holy Ghost himself maketh intercession for us. Intercession. I was, if you remember last week, during the service here last week, we spoke about, yes, he make it intercession. Please note that word, intercession. Intercession. If you know why Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 12, he said, greater things shall you do on earth because I go to my father. You know why he said that? Read down. He said, when I go to my father, I will send a comforter to you. Now, so powerful. The Holy Ghost as a comforter on earth is helping us by making intercession for us. Jesus in heaven is helping us by making what? Intercession for us. And last week when we spoke about the loving God and the consuming fire, I spoke to you about that. And if you recall, I emphasized that the reason we do not see the consuming fire nature is because of the intercessory ministry of Jesus. What's lacking between the old covenants and the new covenant. And people don't understand there are many old covenants. We always look at the Bible to explain, understand the covenants that God had with man. That's not true. Under the Old Testament books, there were two or three or four covenants that God had with humanity. Not one. There is one Old Testament book that we put all Old Testament covenants are under. But then there are many covenants that God had with humanity. Before the Abrahamic covenant, we had the Noahic covenant with humanity. We had the Mosaic covenant with Israel, not with humanity. That's with a nation, not with a people. He had a covenant with Israel. Say, hear, O Israel. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 1. Hear, O Israel. The Lord your God is one. So that's with Israel. And when he brought the Ten Commandments, it was for the Israelites. And I told you last week here, I'm sure people were shocked that Abraham was not an Israelite. That Abraham was a Jew. Was a, sorry, was an Hebrew, not a Jew. And people, I mean, MIT Alex said, wow, I didn't hear. I said, oh yeah. Abraham was a false Hebrew. And of course, he as an Hebrew gave birth to Isaac. Isaac gave birth to who? Jacob. Jacob gave birth to who? Twelve tribes of Israel. The fourth son of Jacob is called Judah. From where you have the word Jews. So you can't say Abraham was a Jew. So Abraham was a Hebrew and his loins 
Those that came from his loins were Hebrews. Don't tell them, including the Ishmaelites. Because he was the first Hebrew that was known in scriptures. Genesis chapter 14 says, Abraham the Hebrew. <laughs> Praise God. You see, there's a lot of heresies flying around. I mean, last night, I, I saw something online and I sent to my son, Gideon. He likes, he likes to, to fish online. And I told him, please be careful. All this fishing you are doing online, may you not go and catch the wrong fish. If that guy, he knows how to fish online. He sends me all kind of stuff from online. So I send it back to him as well. Whenever I say heresy, I'll, so both of us, we like to send to each other. So I saw one yesterday, I sent to him. Because I know he may have seen that thing that I saw. And he sent me a reply. Daddy, this thing looks like it's true. It looks, it, it, the man sounds like he's correct. I said, how can that man be correct? The man was speaking, he's a false prophet, by the way. And he was speaking that the devil is anointed. That, yes, because Ezekiel says he was the anointed cherub. Since he called him anointed cherub, that is still anointed. Now, how can you say, how did he say it? That, that is, that many men of God are anointed, the devil is anointed. That the devil does not fear anointing. Please, media, there's so much of tweeters here. He doesn't fear anointing or something like that. Am I right? So the guy said that. So, and I said to him, I said, how can you tell me that the devil is anointed? So, because he was inside, but the man sounds logical. So I understood immediately that what Gideon does is to logically try to reason scriptures. He said because he said, anointed Jerob, so he's still anointed. But you see, you don't understand, you have to use scriptures to interpret scriptures. Does that make sense? Use scriptures. He could not, he is not anointed anymore. He was a cherub in God's presence. And you have to understand the word anointing. People don't understand the word anointing at all. And it breaks my heart. Because we don't even understand what the word anointing means. Anointing is to smear God's presence on you through an emblem. Now, what we do when we anoint you with something is what we consider as anointing. And I've often asked people, was Jesus anointed? They would say, yes. Show me one place in scriptures where he was anointed with oil. None. And yet he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. So when, did, when was he anointed? For he quoted from Isaiah 61. So when was Jesus anointed? And secondly, with what was he anointed? If we always think it's only oil that we use to anoint us, with what was he anointed? So, so you need to understand what the word anointing means. People don't understand it. And so I use Isaiah 61 a lot to explain anointing. The word anointing, you are anointed for a purpose. Somebody may be anointed to be a king. Another person is anointed to be a priest. In other words, God's presence will come upon you to function in an office. So the moment I remove you from that office, you cease to function there. So if I anoint, show me to be a resident pastor. And show me least the church. He's no longer a resident pastor. You can't tell me he's still anointed. He can't still be anointed. It doesn't make any sense that he will still be anointed. Even though he has left that office. Does that make sense? So, so when he was anointed cherub to stay in God's presence, to serve God in a particular role, and, and then he messed up and God kicked him out. He's lost the office, he's lost the role, he's lost the anointing. Because that anointing was meant for a purpose. Am I communicating? Is it, is that, is that simple? So you can't tell me he's still anointed when he's lost the purpose for the anointing. He was anointed for a purpose, the cherub, to minister to God in that particular office. So he lost the office, he lost the anointing, he lost the authority. He's now Satanus. He was Lucifer, but he's no more Lucifer, he's now Satan. Does that make sense? It's no more Lucifer. You keep mixing it up. You keep using Lucifer interchangeably for Satan. The same person, but two different roles. In this starting passage in Ezekiel 28, he said in verse 11, 12, that you are perfect in beauty, blah, 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 you are this. But in later verses, he said, until you, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty, until you corrupted your wisdom. So you see, previously you were full of wisdom, but later you corrupted your wisdom. So it tells us something happened, and then we cast you out. So at the point where you corrupted your wisdom, you can't say you're still wise. And, and the wisdom of God. Does that make sense? So the guy is not anointed. I'll give you an example. When in first, then let me tell you how anointing works. Which, watch me. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. 
Why? Because he has anointed me. Isaiah 61 verse 1. Two things. Who anointed me? Who? Eh? The Lord. So let's say he, Pastor Yika, serves as the Lord. Let me change that phrase so you can understand it. The spirit of Yinka is upon me because Yinka has anointed me. That's what it means there. So Yinka's spirit follows Yinka's anointing. So when Yinka was anointing me, he said, let my spirit rest upon you. Does that make sense? I'm going somewhere. Does that make sense? I'm saying that so you can understand the anointing. Now, if you now go to Isaiah, 1 Samuel chapter 16. Give me 1 Samuel 16. Because many of you don't understand the anointing. And <laughs> this is going to be very interesting. We're going to read a couple of verses here. I want to explain anointing to you. Because many people don't understand anointing. At least. And, I'm, and my heart is broken. If you are an anointed psalmist, you may never carry the grace of a preacher. Because what the spirit is upon you to do is different from what you want to do. If you function outside of your anointing, you will struggle. If you function outside the place of your anointing, you will struggle. So look at First Samuel chapter 16. And the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul? Seeing I have rejected him from being uh, to over Israel. Fill your hall with on, or send it to Jesse. The babe, I will provide me a king for my sons. Verse 2. Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. Go to verse 6. Quickly, verse 6. Verse 6. And it came to pass when they were come that he looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed. Don't forget, he had not anointed him. He just said, This is the person that God has chosen. You got it. This is the person. God told me, I've provided myself the next king. Surely the Lord's anointed. Had he anointed the guy then? Why would you use the phrase, the Lord's anointed? You know that you don't need me, the oil. I'm not using the oil to explain who God has chosen. God has his choice. This is the person that God has chosen. I just want to do my own bit to support what God has decided to do. Does that make sense? So the Lord's anointed. Surely. And then look at the next verse. Give me the next verse. God said, no, 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 no. This, don't look at him. That's not my anointed. Blah, blah, blah. I'm going somewhere. I've refused him because you did not see the way you see. Now go to the verse 11, I think. Go down to verse 11. So let's see, let's see the Lord's anointed. The proper Lord's anointed. And somebody said to Jesse, is this, are this the only children you have? He said, no, one more. Go ahead, verse 12. Verse 12, and he said, and brought him now. You see from verse 13, arise, anoint him for this is he. Look at this verse, everybody. So Samuel took the oil, anointed him in the midst of his brethren, and, and what? Connect this to Isaiah 61. The spirit of the Lord is what? Because. So you see, I want to ask which of the two, I'm going somewhere. Which of the two is heavier? The physical anointing or the presence of the spirit. The presence of the spirit is just to say that you carry God's presence. To be king. Was he anointed to be a psalmist? No. Because he was already a psalmist before then. He said, I have provided me a king. So this anointing is to be the king. Yet he calls himself sweet psalmist. In 2 Samuel 23, that's a skill I learned, and I did well there, competence. But this is my anointing to be king and to be of Israel. Now, well, give me back, go, go back to that verse. I'm going somewhere. I'm going to ask you a question of you. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, sorry, and then the Spirit of God came upon him from that day forward. From that day forward. Look at the next verse. Look at the next verse. Verse 14. And the Spirit of the Lord departed from whom? Why? We can't have two kings in the same kingdom. As far as God is concerned, he may still have the crown, but he's lost 
the anointing. So Saul was still king in the office. But spiritually, David carried the spirit and the grace. So in chapter 17, when they saw Goliath, that's why Saul could not kill Goliath. He was afraid. David could say, let me fight. Yeah, he not carry hair to deliver Israel. Let me ask you a question. This has happened to me several times. Had Samuel anointed Eliab mistakenly in error and says, Behold the next king of Israel. Would the spirit be upon him? But would you not would you know? So I can mistakenly ordain people and they don't carry the grace. You can inhale pour the oil. And many pastors have inhaled pour the oil. <laughs> and the spirit is not upon them. Because we magnify the oil above the spirit. But the spirit follows the, the real person. If you pour oil on the wrong person, the spirit will not come there. If you get it right with the person, if you pour oil, Holy Ghost will come upon the person. Because the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he, the Lord, has anointed me. So if I pour the anointing oil on the wrong person, the Spirit of the Lord will not come upon him because he's not the one anointed or chosen by God. Am I communicating? So, so the devil is not anointed. Was the anointed cherub? Is no more anointed. Does not carry the presence of God to function in any office. So what is he anointed for? So which false preacher does not understand scripture? So what is the anointing on his life for? What yokes are they breaking? He's placing yokes on people, not breaking yokes. So I can say the devil is anointed because we found in a scripture where they say anointed cherub without you having deep understanding of interpreting that passage. He's no more the cherub. He has left that office. He's left the office. Long time ago. He's left the office. There was an office I was operating in that anointed me to be the senior pastor of my former church. I've left that place since. You can't say I'm still the pastor of that church. No, I'm not. The, I was anointed, consecrated into that office. But when I resigned from that office, I left the office. My wife was consecrated technically to be ES of a corporation. Policemen were with her. The day she left, the policemen left her. So can you say the devil left the office he still has the perks of the office. Am I communicating? Shame applies with the anointing. The day God anointed David, the Holy Ghost left Saul. Evil spirit came in. Because the anointing was protecting him. The moment the Holy Ghost leaves, you are vulnerable. When he was there, they couldn't come. Am I communicating? Yes, sir. The moment he leaves, you are vulnerable. I suppose they can, they can invade your life. <laughs> they can invade. And the anointing means the presence of God to carry out a particular task. Now, does that make sense? So it could be a priesthood, it could be the prophetic, it could be the apostolic... It could be whatever. It could be to serve in a particular place. It could be to be a psalmist. It could be to whatever. You just have the grace. And you can sense that you carry that grace. You know it. And like late Archbishop Idaos has said, when that grace leaves, you will also know. Because there's, there's a gift and there's a grace to function in that gift. The gift, the gift and the callings of God are without repentance. But the enabling grace comes and goes. That's the mistake we make. We make it look like the moment God gives me a gift of healing, I carry it forever. No, no. I need grace to operate that gift. So the gift will be there. I won't take it. But it's the grace that will live. The grace is God's favorable, unmerited favor towards you to 
operate and function in certain offices and with some gifts. Now, if I now begin to live in sin and begin to despise his presence, like David said, take not the Holy Spirit from me. I begin to abuse the grace. You can frustrate the grace. So you, you will not be able to, I, I can't be in prostitutes and begin to say, let me pray for you. You'll be sick. The grace will not be there. But the gift is there. But if I come back in true repentance, genuine repentance, and I say God says for like two, three, four, five years, oh, you may stir up the gift of God that is in thee. Not stir up the grace. I don't know. Am I, am I Am I communicating? Am I communicating? I want to be sure, because you're looking at me like this. <laughs> you're getting me. God bless you. Because I'm, I'm going back to the message today. I've, I've not even touched a message. It's because this man of God here told me, he's speaking common sense. He told me, he said, that man is speaking correct thing. I said, Gideon, what is correct here? I don't know many more people. Do you now understand it? That the devil is not a... Oh, oh, the gift and the anointing. God bless you. Because they make it look like the gift and is there. The anointing is there forever. You can't lose it. Oh, no, you can. Oh, no, you can. Praise God in the highest. Now, let's go to our sermon tonight. And then my time is almost up. So, last week, you remember, I explained this subject to us. What the Bible says about a loving God and a consuming fire. If you recall, I tried as much as possible. It's not working again to emphasize what? The nature of God. Because I emphasized the nature of God very well. I said the subject matter here. And somebody asked me a question about predestination. And I'll probably try to broach on it tonight to explain the nature of God. The problem with us, when we struggle to understand how can a loving God still be the consuming fire? How can that be possible? And I made a lot of effort last week to give you the answer as understanding the nature of God, who God is. Who is this God? If you understand his nature, it's multidimensional, it's multifaceted. That's why we understand him as the same loving God. He, I, Pastor Inka got it last week when I said it will be against his nature not to be fair and just. And because of God's nature as a just God, just, just, he had to be just, fair, and truthful. So if he bends his laws, then he will be unjust. And he cannot be unjust. So when you see him demonstrate his consuming fire nature, he's just being fair and just. And that's what we don't understand. We want to see his only loving side, which is fantastic. But he said, if you do this, do this, do this, this and this shall happen to you. And that side, we don't like. But it's his nature to be fair, to be just, not be unrighteous. And we saw that every time you find God demonstrating his consuming fire nature, you find that it's the people that do things that deserve that manifestation. However, how come in this day and age, under this new covenant grace, we don't see the consuming fire more like all the old covenant grace. I say because of the role that Jesus plays currently as the intercessor. And we underestimate, undermine the office of the ministry of our intercessor. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 to 3, that we have an advocate with the Father if we sin, which is not sin, but just in case we sin, we have an advocate, a prosecutor, an intercessor, who stands there? Hebrews chapter 7 tells us clearly that Jesus liveth forever, making intercessions for the saints. Can you imagine? Liveth forever, making intercession. So that ministry of, uh, of intercession, we don't understand it. We don't understand that. That's why, that is what is stopping Baba for you, for you seeing that consuming fire nature. Because there's someone there making intercession. And I gave you an example of the intercessors in scriptures. Remember I said that? I said Abraham was an intercessor. Remember I said that to you? And I said Abraham as an intercessor interceded for who? Sodom and Gomorrah. Up to ten souls. And I told you the good news. That Jesus will not stop at ten. What Abraham stopped. That's the good news. He will still go and say, Baba, if there are five souls, don't go. Baba, if there's one. If it's possible to intercede for half. Christ will intercede for half. Because he died for all of us. 
And so the, the ministry of intercession is primarily for the saints. In John chapter 11, what we call the high priestly prayer of Christ. High priestly prayer. Go to John chapter 17. John 17 verse 9 to 12. He said, I pray for this one. Not for those in the world, but for them. Because they are part of me. I pray for them, you see. I pray for them. I pray not for the world. The word pray means intercession. Intercession is when you stand to pray for somebody else and not yourself. Supplication and petition is when you stand to pray for yourself and not somebody else. We do not have intercessors anymore in church. Intercession is prosecution, like a prosecutor or like someone, an advocate, somebody, a mediator that says, please help him, help him. It's not about me, like a lawyer pleading your cause. That's what intercession means. Supplication is different from intercession. Both are prayers. The only difference is emphasis on me or on others. So when he says he make it intercession for the saints. Now, people don't know that. Do you think that, that Jesus is praying for the world? He's died for the world. He expects us to go and preach to the world. But he's more particular and concerned with his body. Oh yes, he doesn't want the world to perish. He doesn't want anybody to perish. But he knows that you and I, we are weak. He knows we are weak because he knows our infirmities. We are frail. We are frail. Psalm 78 says we are frail. Psalm 105 says we are weak and feeble. So that's who we are. As human beings, we are not strong enough. So what he does is that he says, because I know them, they won't be able to go through what I went through. He, get, he went through all things and he was not tempted. He get the point. So let me stand in the gap. To explain intercession very carefully, I like what Aaron did. And intercession is a high priestly, is a priestly role. Intercession is what? A priestly role. If you read that Hebrews 7, give me Hebrews 7 verse 25. It's a priestly role. Christ was, Christ stood as king, priest, and prophet. But Christ, whenever we talk about intercession, we're speaking about his priestly role. Wherefore, he is able to save them to the uttermost that come to God by him, Jesus, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. So even for us to eternally be saved, we need his intercessory ministry. Does that make sense? He needs to keep intercession for us. And if you read previous verses of that Hebrews 7, he was comparing him to who? Melchizedek and his office. So who was Melchizedek? A high priest. So the office of Christ here is that of what? The priest. He is the high priest of our profession. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 1 to 3. Apostle and high priest of our profession. You see, the only thing is that when he said he made, unto, he made us unto God in Revelation 1 verse 10, kings and priests did not make us prophets because he can't prophesy to God. He made us unto God kings and priests, kings to rule on earth, priests to intercede for ourselves and intercede for the church and intercede for, our, for the world, to stand in the gap for the world. But as prophets, we're supposed to go to the world and speak the word of truth. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? So the reason we do not see that consuming fire nature is because of the intercessory ministry of who? Watch me. Of Christ. But the second one is also of the Holy Ghost. Because Holy Ghost also makes intercession for us with groanings. Groanings. Romans chapter 8 verse 26, 27. That cannot be uttered. Intercession. So he, that's, why, he, that's why I thank God for what Dr. Leslie did tonight when we were praying in tongues. When we were praying in tongues, I mean, that's, that's why I am very particularly worried about the generation of young people today. And they don't understand it. Likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. So what's the infirmity? Is the ignorance. Because the, it's not that we don't know what we should pray for. Everybody knows what to pray for. I want a new car. I'll pray for a new car. I want a new wife. I'll pray for a new wife. I want a new husband. So you can't tell me I don't know what we should pray for. As we ought. So it's not the prayer point. It's how to marshal it. So it's not the item. We don't know what we should pray for. Mm -mm. As we ought to. As we ought to. So the Holy Ghost shows you a flaw of yours. Shh, shh, shh. And you say, Lord, please make me more patient. Help me to suffer long. Give me the, help me to cultivate the gift of long suffering. Shh, shh, shh. What are you praying for? Husband. How? That's the reason no man is with you. You didn't know. As I asked to, all the men that come, chase away with your 
Impatience, screaming. Bad character, God bless you. So, as we ought to, we know not what we should pray for. As we ought to, we ought to. I need more money. Lord, please help me to be a giver. Touch my heart to give more to the things of the kingdom. As we ought to. And, uh, but nobody prays that kind of prayer. But you don't know that's the way to get more money. There are many ways as we ought to. Lord, I want to, I want more church growth. I won't pray that prayer. But the prayer could be, Lord, help me to raise more leaders. As we ought to. So the prayer point is what we only look at. But the Holy Ghost helps us. With in us is how with groanings. That's what people are speaking about, speaking in tongues. Groaning. I mean, somebody said one day that we can teach you how to groan. I'm not sure we can teach you how to groan. Because the Holy Spirit Himself make it intercession. So it's no man that teaches us. So the moment I begin to teach how to groan, there's a problem. It's no more Holy Ghost, it's not me. With groanings, I used to go to a conference in the 80s, and the pastor is a, is a, is a pastor Carl. It was, a, it was a, a German pastor. It will be two, three thousand young people in the eighties, and he said, "Come on, everybody! Every night for like two weeks, he was teaching us how to groan. Everybody, bend down, follow me. Say, uh, all of us would do. Uh, 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 uh. We'll do ah uh, for one hour. Then we'll stop. They are speaking tongues. We speak for thirty minutes. We we'll go back. I'm teaching how to groan. We we'll go. <coughs> he was giving us different voices. We do. We do ah, and we believed he was teaching us how to groan. My God, we were groaning and sweating. Actually, we were out and I believed it. And, and it was ex- uh, wait, I don't care. We groaned. And I didn't know. Because I thought somebody could teach us how to how to groan in the spirit. Uh, 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 uh. Nobody can teach you how to groan. The moment it becomes mechanical. Did you, did, you, did you see my heart bleeds as I say this? Pentecostal churches have abused the most powerful and potent prayer weapon, praying in the Holy Ghost. I watch drama kids and I see people use it and abuse it. My heart bleeds. It's not happening. Methodist, or that we have abused, and it's a very sacred tool. To the point, and that's why I don't like on those things because it's supposed to be something we use inside. They've taken it outside, and Muslims, unbelievers all know about what you guys call speaking in tongues. And they don't understand it's powerful to the point where that pastor that was jailed uh, last week, uh, when I read the testimony of one of the girls, I cried. I called my wife. She said he was having sex with her, raping her, and was speaking in tongues. She said he was speaking in tongues as he was raping me. I cried. I said, this could not have been God. You know, you know, I cried. How did we get there? If you want to commit your sin, don't bring my God into it. Don't bring a sacred, hallowed prayer tool on the bed of adultery. He said it was, she, she said, she said it in the court. And a Muslim judge had that. Is it powerful? Is there Romans 8? Is there you should identify yourself in the Holy Ghost by praying in the Holy Ghost? Something that is very sacred. It's a prayer tool. It's supposed to be our secret weapon that the only person do not know when we hold ourselves and say rock and balls and we're praying in the Holy Ghost and we go out, and then they now begin to play around with it. And I spoke a few times against it. Some members of my youth ministry don't like me. As they even use it to say they want to do chant on in worship. It's not right. It's almost like you're beginning to script it. Be careful they script it. Okay, hey, it is not scriptural. You're almost scripting it. Why are you people messing up with something sacred? It's not, it can't be it's only goes when it's scripted, it means it's uh hey, scripted. I don't know. I don't, hey. Something extremely spiritual. Potent and powerful. We turn into something you can just use. If you want to, it's not, it doesn't show your spirituality. A young man came, a young woman came to ask me, Sir, if I don't speak in tongues, they say I'm not spiritual. I said, Who told you that? Who told you that? That's not scriptural. Huh? That's not true. That's very false. I encourage you all to pray in the Holy Ghost. But if you don't, it doesn't mean you're not spiritual. 
Spirituality is measured by the way you walk in love. Love is the height of spirituality. I've read my Bible all through. That's the truth. Do I speak in tongues of men, tongues of angels, and have no love? You are nothing before heaven. You are a sounding symbol. As far as God is concerned, empty. First Corinthians 13, read it again on your own. Do you speak in tongues of angels and men and you have no love? He said, you are something same, but you are not empty. I didn't say so. My Bible says so. Is there a tinkering symbol. You are nothing. And you are telling me, do I speak in tongues and I have no love? I'm spiritual. This time we have twisted it. Even if I speak in tongues of men and angels and I have no love, I'm spiritual. And that's what, we're, that's what we're preaching. He said, no. The man that said we should speak in tongues, says, don't leave that above this. Oh, I beg. Be careful. Because this is more difficult to do than that one. Love is more difficult to practice than speaking in tongues. Love, God's own love, God's love, agape, extremely difficult. Agape. That's why I preach on Sunday. Humility. Agape. To love like God loved. Ah. Why well, read First Corinthians thirteen and tell me if you are doing twenty percent of it? Love bears all things. Love forgives. Love thinks well of others. Love will not suspect. Love will lift you. Love will think about the well-being of others. You are you doing half of that? Love. <laughs> Agape. Not number one. The God's kind of love. That while on the cross of Calvary, say forgive them. While he's there. Not after he became king. It's easier to forgive you when I'm up there. When I'm carrying the pain to say forgive. Love. If you read First Corinthians 13, you will understand why love, God's kind of love, is the, it, that's the only way to know if a man is spiritual. Spiritual. Watch me. Spiritual. Spiritual is to bear the fruits, not to bear the gifts. The fruit of the Spirit is love. If you read Galatians, it didn't say the fruits. The fruit of the Spirit is love. Gentleness. All others emanate from that love. He mentioned nine, but love is the mother of them all. If you have this, you will bear that. The fruit of the spirit is love. Do you know what the word fruit means? It comes from the word seed. Can you bear fruit if you don't have seed? A guava seed cannot produce orange fruit. To have the fruit of the spirit means you must have one. <laughs> And that seed will be watered and watered with the word of God. Then you start bearing. You, you have so, I was telling my staff uh, on Monday, I was teaching them leadership. And I told them forces about life, forces, charisma, character, competence, and capacities. I was teaching them to build capacity. Now those forces are important. The fifth one, I didn't, I hid it from them. That's cash. So, uh, so I don't want, I don't want to go for cash. So I, put, I, 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 I need to hide cash. I said, if you want to know who you are, follow men that have character. So I began to test them what you have. They, they all agree. We had my session. We had a debate. Of these four, which is the most important? Charisma is the, the, the leaves that a tree has got. It's a gift. Charisma is what pulls people to you. Charisma. All which is charismatic. Whenever she sings here, I feel like singing. The people that when they sing, I feel like sitting. When all she dances, all which she do the chair she sings and dances. That's called charisma. It's a gift, a talent that attracts people to you. Even our Lord and Savior was deceived with charisma. There was a tree that had leaves. Jesus was drawn to the tree. Drawn charisma pulled my master to the tree. Ah, where are the fruits? Character. Fruits are what character by their fruits we shall know them, not by their leaves. So fruit is what gift is what charisma. That's why people are. That's why I don't expect people that are gifted, but have no fruit. You can be so talented. 
So gifted. Oh, some say I'm a gifted speaker. I don't agree. Some say because I is charismatic on the pulpit. Maybe I have gifts, but I also want to bear fruit. I want you to come close to me because the man has character. Not because he has charisma. Oh, competence is your hand. Something you do better. That man is the most competent keyboardist I know. You're not playing anymore. He has, he has programmed the thing. Those, those, <laughs> he's not that he's not, he's not listening. <laughs> so I am not competent on the keyboard. He's more competent than I am. In singing, I'm not, I, sent, I sent a video to you of that man that was singing that song. I, I, saw, I, I saw a video online. Very bad video. One man is singing a song of love to his uh, fiance. Can you, me, can you send a video to them? Let them show it here. No, you, you all laugh. Send the video to them for me in the media. I have never seen. So I sent it to Gideon. I said, Gideon, please. This is why I stay on my lane. <laughs> clap for me, clap for me. I know my lane. Send the video, you know that video. No, you send it to them. I have never seen it. The man should not sing at all. The man was singing. He don't have it. I stay on my lane. Even as bad as I am, actually, I can perform better than that man. Oh no, no, I am a better singer than that man. Yet I know I am not competent. Competence has to do with the skills of your hands. Psalm 78, verse 72. David said, with he fed and led Israel with the integrity of his heart and the skillfulness of his hands. Integrity of the heart is character. Skillfulness of his hands is competence. Charisma is the anointing. Verse 70. So that was found him with the holy oil upon his head. That is charisma. When God gives you a gift that you are now pulling a crowd to you. Charisma. It was a charisma, you see, that chose him. That brought uh, David, then Goliath, down. The last one is what? Capacity. That is how much you can carry and do. He gave one three talents. He gave one five. He gave one one. Severally according to the ability or capacity. So I was trying, that's capacity. Capacity. So somebody else may have larger capacity than me, but may not have character. So of the four, which one do you think is important? I was asking them. So the man, this woman has capacity to run a choir of 500, but lacks character. That man is a good MD. You can be a good choir master, but all your daughters will be, be pregnant. So you are following capacity and charisma, but no character. All of them is sleeping with them because he lacks character. Am I communicating? You can have capacity, you can have charisma, and lack character. Am I making sense? And you can even have competence and still lack all that. So, I was trying to explain to them the importance of character. That's why I told you that the devil can be charismatic with his music, but lacks character. And what Christianity is supposed to raise are men and women of what? And we don't do that anymore. The emphasis shifted many years ago to maybe competence, capacity, and even charisma. And we have de-emphasized character in the choice of leaders in church. You see men who have the Holy Ghost, men who walk well, who walk in love. We say, no, 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 they speak in tongues. Speaking in tongues is more important than walking in love. That's what I'm going to. No, love is what? Character. That's a fruit. That's what makes you a better believer. We should choose, we should walk with Christians that have character. Men of God, Christians that come to church that are faithful with the words of their mouth, that have integrity in their heart, that are not going to go out there and be corrupt and steal. Those that understand tolerance, forbearance, long suffering, those are the character traits we should look out for in ourselves. And when we lack them, we should pray that God will help us to cultivate and nurture. Those are the things that show us that we are Christians. Because Christianity is about building the character of Christ in people. Character of Christ, not just the charisma of Christ. That's what Christianity is all about. How can I raise men and women with the character of Christ? Let me go to my sermon. Have you sent it to them? Please let me project that video. I want them to laugh small. So you can see the man. Very beautiful video. Media! If you have the video, project. If you don't have it, I'll go out my sermon. Have you sent it to media? Very powerful video about a young man who was singing a song. Even Godwin can sing better than the man. And this man cannot sing anything. He sings off-key, Y-key, in-key. 
but everybody else can perform. Okay, let me go to my sermon when they're ready to let me know. So, eh? so let's go back to our sermon. Please, ministry of intercession is why we do not see the consuming fire. Let's quickly go to some of the consuming fire. Now, somebody asked a question last week about the predestination and the full knowledge. Let me quickly explain that to you. Because I want to mention that before I go to the message, and I don't have too much time. Acts chapter, uh, Acts chapter 2 tells us there are some words that we play around with. Predestination, foreknowledge, purpose, plan, and the will of God. They're all intertwined. And people don't know the difference with all that one. The consuming fire, I've told about this. I'll just keep it there, I'll come back to it. Now, the foreknowledge of God is what we call Acts chapter 2, verse 13, 14, 15, 23, 33, I think, tells us about the foreknowledge of God when he was explaining why and how Jesus died. It means the nature of God that we call omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. God is all everywhere. God has all power. God knows all things. Before anything happens, I had foreknowledge. God is aware that it will happen. And what we now say is, whom he did foreknow, Romans chapter 8, we say he did predestinate. In other words, the fact they hacked of the nature of God that knows all things, foreknowledge ahead of its happening, some now say it means God has predestinated. Not that God created it to be like that. He knew before it will occur that this is how it will end. So that act, what we call the predestination of God. Now, so what some try to do is to say God meandered, navigated, and planned it so that you would do that. No. Whenever we talk about God's nature, we should never forget man's nature. So why we miss it is we make it look like man is a robot who does not have his free will to decide what to do and what not to do. Today, today, I can choose to stop being a Christian and it will be my decision. But if I now walk away from Christ to say I want to backslide from today, it's to make a side that took, took that decision. But in five years' time, you will say, God knew that I would take that decision for knowledge. God knew because nothing catches God unawares. God did not tell me to backslide. It is my decision, but God knew that this man would do this. What you now say is, why didn't God stop him? You see, you see God should be unfair. He made me to make to be a free moral agent. When he created man, he said man should be able to take decisions on his own. So to say God should stop me from, from, to, from making decisions would be wrong for God to do. That's not who God is. He is saying God should not be God, but it's against his nature. He created you to be a free moral agent, to have a free will, and he gives you all the opportunity to love him, but you chose not to love him. He knew you would not love him. Now say, why didn't you stop me from not loving him? No, but that's not how God created me to behave. Does that make sense? He didn't make me a robot. So we still want to blame him for not stopping us from doing what we choose to do. So there are two natures here, man's nature, God's nature. God made man to be a free moral agent. So when a man now makes a decision against God, do not blame him for not stopping man for making that decision. But God made you to be free to say, make your decision. Adam, there's good and evil, but please, don't touch this. Eat this. If you touch this, you will die. And why didn't God stop him from eating it? Down, 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 down. <laughs> Did you get it? Why must you blame God for everything? Why can't you blame yourself and say, I took that decision. It was a wrong decision and I take full responsibility for my decision. We don't want to blame him for doing everything. He didn't make us to be robots. Man is not a robot. That's the answer for all those that ask. You have to understand man's nature and God's nature as well. So God did not create us to be robots. Praise God. Now, that consuming fire theology, there are about five of them here. God's destructive judgment. If you find here, you find... Uh, no, go back to. I, I don't want, these are all the fires. They have, we've gone through this last week. There are five explanations of God's fire in scriptures. The one we're discussing today is the consuming fire. Now, these are five examples of when God showed up as consuming fire. The first one, when he consumed soldiers that came to arrest Elijah in 2 Kings chapter 1, verse 6 to 15. And I told that was what he did as God consuming fire. Second one, when he consumed Sodom and Gomorrah after Abraham interceded. God said, if I find 10, I will stop it. 
but he couldn't find ten. In fact, out of the one, two, three, four, he picked one, went back, Lord's wife. <laughs> For it, he only, he only chose three. Lord's wife looked back and became a pillar of what? Salt. So God was right. In this instance, you and I would agree, God couldn't find ten. He could only rescue four. From before he rescued, son of petition still went back, Lord's wife. And he said, remember Lord's wife. Meaning that even those that we pulled out of Egypt may not make it to the land. Out of Sodom, rather, may not make it out. Remember Lord's wife. He never said, remember Lord's daughters. Remember Lord's wife. Praise God. When he consumed Nadam and Abihu, you know that. This is very important and instructive. They came up with wrong fires and God consuming fire destroyed them because they did what was wrong on his altar. When people complained against him and the fire consumed those at the back of the camp of Israel, Numbers 11, those at the back, neither that were backsliding, the fire of God came down and consumed them. So we have examples of God showing up. When Korah and, and Ko rebelled against Moses, this is very, very important. They rebelled against Moses and God destroyed them. If after that destruction, if you read verse 42, the people still cried against God. After God killed Korah and 250 rebels, and God now brought forth a plague in the land. The plague was killing them all. So Aaron now moved into the intercessory ministry. Aaron now stood there between the dead and the living, started to pray for them. Dead and the living, blessed and the cursed. Life and death. Intercessory ministry is to stay in the gap and say, please Lord, stop the plague. The Bible said when Aaron did that, it was Moses that told Aaron, it is your own job to intercede. I'm the king, you're the priest, go and intercede. It wasn't him. Moses did not do Aaron's job. Aaron did not do Moses' job. Moses went in there and stood in the gap and immediately, the Bible says, the plague stopped. So imagine how many of us are not standing in the gap and the plague is still continuing. Because we refuse to stand in between the living and the dead. If we can only go there and pray and see God's face, the plague will stop. Now, God's nature is to understand the word. Now, I'm going to give you 10 of God's nature quickly. Number one, God is a spirit, yes or no? Number two, God is not man, yes or no? Don't forget that, because many times when we think about God, we think about him being a man. God is not man. God is not what? Don't ever forget that God is not man. Number three, God is sovereign and cannot be questioned. Go and read Romans chapter 7 on your own. What sovereignty of God means that he can do anything he wants to do and you have no right to question him. If human beings on earth have displayed their own sovereignty as kings, and we say in Yoruba land, ka biosi, ka biosio, meaning that we cannot question you. If in those days, the king would look at the fine girl and say, Mugeseli, and that's all. And nobody can question. You can, you're not meant to question a king in a land when it takes control over anything. So much more God. That's just a little bit of divine sovereignty. That's just man trying to act as a sovereign over a land. And we find that comfortable, but do not understand divine sovereignty. Do, do you get the point now? That's God as sovereign. Uh, and there are many more scriptures. Number five, God is omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent. Is there? He said, I'm the almighty God. That's, that's God as, as sovereign. Then number five, God is a judge on the earth. Very important. All things come to him. He judges all things. God is the judge. Judge means that he has a final say. He has a final say. That's what the scripture. This, all this as God's nature should help you to understand him as both loving God and a consuming fire. Number six, God is a just God. This number six is very important. This is a critical one for me. He's a just God. Hence, consuming fire and merciful God. Read for me Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 21. Give us Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 21, media. I will show you something there from that book alone to see God as a consuming fire. And at the same time, look at it. Furthermore, the Lord was angry with me for your sake. This was Moses. And swore that I should not go over to Jordan. And I should not go into that good land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for inheritance. Next verse. But I must die in this land. I must not go over to Jordan. That's what God told him. But you shall go over and possess that good land. Next verse. Take it, all of you, therefore. All of you. Why? Lest you forget. He started by saying, if God can deal with me, to say, me, Moses, I will not enter. Be careful. Who are you? Me, he said, I will enter. Who are you? Take it. Don't forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you. Make a graven image. If you make a graven image, a likeness, verse 24. Why? 
For the Lord your God is a what? So he said to you, me, me, me. He dealt with me. Be careful. God will consume anybody who, and he's a jealous God. Next verse. Next verse. That's not verse 24. Consuming fire. Am I right? When you have got your children, blah, 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 verse 25, 26, I'm good at that one. 26. Can you see? 27. I want to rush it. The Lord shall scatter your nations. 28. He's teaching them out what to do. There shall you serve the Lord your God. 29. Don't serve any other gods, oh, please, oh. But if from thence you seek the Lord thy God and they shall find him. If you find God, if thou seek him with all your heart, with all your soul, what will happen to you? Verse 30. When thou art in tribulation and all these things come upon you, even in your latter days, if thou turn to the Lord thy God, shall be obedient unto his voice. Verse 31. The Lord thy God is a merciful God. In verse 24, consuming fire. Verse 31, merciful God. Can you see the loving God as a consuming fire in the same passage? So it just tells you that it's the same. The same God you will experience his mercy. The same God you can see his wrath. The same passage. But it depends on what you do. It's you that will activate the consuming fire. You activate a merciful God. But today, we have an intercessor. They didn't have intercessor. So that's why we see his mercy more than we see his fire. Because intercessor like who? Aaron stands in the gap. Which means that intercessor like Aaron says what? Stands in the gap. To say, no, 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 no fire, no fire, no fire, no fire. I mean fire, no fire, no fire. Even Moses, God said, I want to kill them. No, no, please, please. I beg, don't do that. So we keep, we, we underestimate the role of the intercessor. We don't know it. And that's what we should do today. We should just worship him and say, Lord, thank you for being my mediator. Thank you. So from your heart, say, Lord, thank you. To thank him for being our intercessor. Because many times we don't understand that. But for Christ, who knows where we will be today. So God is also a loving God and a God of love. First John chapter 4 tells us, for God is love. God is long-suffering towards us. Very clear. That's his nature. So that we do not perish. God is holy and holy. God is true and cannot lie. I'm going to stop there. Put your hands together for Jesus. Put your hands together for Jesus. I'm going to take one or two questions and then there are we're going to pray. One or two questions. We have questions. Please take microphone. God <clears throat> as a loving God and a consuming fire. Yes, one or two questions quickly. Loving God and consuming fire. I want to sing, but I won't sing now. <laughs> Praise God. Let me take the questions briefly and quickly so we can pray. Have you been blessed? So don't say Satan is anointed anymore. Over to you, sir. Praise God. Um, thank you, Papa, for that clarification because it has bothered me for long, but I still need a little bit of clarification. Um, well, I want to make uh, first a clarification on last week. Uh, someone asked uh, the question of praying Holy Ghost fire, fire to fire. Yes. And you clarified the, the person that I brought here. Um, but then after you explained to him the way it should be, he made a comment, it's difficult, to, and you laughed. But then... It, the Bible says that in order to get in, get understanding. Yes. If you understand who you are as a Christian, yes. Am I a person that blesses? Yes. A person that calls? Yes. Then it will reflect the kind of prayer you will pray. Yes. Then if you understand the nature of the Holy Spirit, yes. It's a comforter. Yes. And he came to intercede. Yes. And comfort us. And not, to, and not to destroy. You know the kind of prayer you pray with his name. Yes. And again, if you understand the nature of Christ, yes. Who after everything done to him, and he said, Father, forgive them, <gasps> but they don't know what they are saying. <gasps> they don't know the kind of prayer that you pray. Yes. Then that one is by the way. And for uh, this predestination, when I asked myself, I said, okay, God as omniscient God that knows the end from the beginning. Yes. Might have known our action. Then might have known, okay, that this is what we will do. But then I remember Jonah. Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. He was running away. But he was forced by a fish to go to, to Nineveh. <laughs> now, it's now like acting against his will. Because, uh, okay, um, I always take the, uh, Mary and Judas as case study. Mary had been prophesied before he had birth. You will be the mother of Christ. Judas had been prophesied before his birth. You will, be, you will betray Christ. And 
you cannot now do against the, 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 the prophecy. It was the aside that the prophet did the two of them. So how then do you run away from prophecy? Because the Jonah was supposed to go to Nineveh. He said, no, Lord, I won't go. And he was still forced by a fish to go to the Nineveh. How then will you... Uh, how, what, is, what is the place of that free will? And the, then again, the, the Bible said, I shall bless whom I shall bless. And I shall cause whom I shall cause. Yes. Then what is the place of being just and a loving father to all of us? And then blessing some people and then causing some, some, some people. Okay. Then, um, you said again. Uh, You're asking like five questions. So. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm trying to make. No, uh, in, actually, I want to be sure. Well, I can't even remember. I don't think it's a scribe. Yeah, writing out the I'm questions. I'm trying to. You know, sir, no, I'm trying I, to. I am happy. Mm, Bible study is the only time in a church when we take questions and answers. And I'm happy because this is the design of our Bible study. So people can ask us these questions and we can address them and answer them. And these questions are very deep questions, extremely deep. And I'm happy because it shows. You know a man's level of maturity with the questions they ask you. These are not ABC questions. These are deep questions. So yeah, I'm glad. Go ahead. I'm trying I just to want somebody to help me write them down. Nobody write them down for me so I can take them. Go ahead. So then you say that um, God is um, God cannot lie. And he I cannot. believe that God cannot lie. But then I was reading Genesis. Yes. And I got confused. Why? God told Adam and Eve. Yes. Do not eat this fruit. If yes. you eat this fruit, you will die. Yes. The devil called, came and told them. I, yes. Is that is that what he told you? Don't mind him. If you eat this fruit, yes. your eyes will open. And they ate the fruit, and their eyes truly open. Yes. Now I wonder, between God and devil, who now who not lie to them? Clap for him. I will start with Genesis. So you actually believe that Shua house. That's all uh, Julius. Are you the one teaching? Uh -huh. I will start with Genesis. You actually believe that the devil said the truth. Mm -mm, wait, wait. God said the day you eat the fruit you shall die. The devil said first, first thing he said you shall not die. Now, after you eat the fruit, God did not say your eyes will not open. God did not say you will not be like us. You will not be supernaturally to have some knowledge. He didn't say that. He said you will die. God did not say all that things that will happen with it. The devil came to magnify these things and did not say this. As a result of that death, spiritual death, they saw things. They became like God. God himself said in verse 22, man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. God said that. Let me stop him from eating the tree of life. So God did not lie. God, he died. Satan did not say the truth. They died. Their eyes being opened has nothing to do with death. It's like me saying to you, if you take that job, you'll get a new car get a new car. They'll give you a driver. But Father said, if you get that job, you'll lose your citizenship of being Nigerian. And you got the car, you got the driver, but they stripped you of your citizenship. Of what use is the car and driver? Go and use it in Togo. He said, but God did not tell me that I won't get the car. He didn't say you won't get the car. But you lost your citizenship. And that citizenship is more important than the car. Oh, your eyes will open. But that's just a car. You, you know good and evil. That's the perks of the office. But there's something that happened to you that is the foundation. That you've lost the garden. Because you're dead spiritually. And so people don't understand that the devil, the devil came to me, Jesus. And he told him, he said, if you bow down before me, I will give you all the kingdoms of this world. He said, for they have been given to me. Oh, it's true. Adam gave it to him. He snatched it from Adam. He did. But you said, no, 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 you are trying to trap me like you trapped Eve. I'm not foolish. I will not bow before you. I will still get the kingdoms of this world, but not by bowing down to you, but by going to the cross. So he went to the cross, and he still got the same thing, but through a different route, not through this one. He said, oh, he said, if you, if you, if you, he, said, he promised to give his angels charge over you. 
So yes, you dash your foot against the stone. He didn't quote that scripture well. This is different. He said, no, thou shalt not end the Lord thy God. What he meant is that if I am in a situation where angels need to protect me, they will help me. But this what you are doing now is I should go and now tempt the Lord so that angels can help me. Like my brother Daniel that went to fall in lion's den in Ibadan. And the lions ate him up. Or that man that took a snake and said, they will not bite me. And snake beat him and he died. Many pastors in southern part of Texas. And so people can read and misread the scriptures. So the devil lied, God did not lie. Number two, Jonah. Jonah was, what you said about Jonah is wrong. Jonah said, I don't want to go to Nineveh. Why? I know you. If I go there and they repent, you will forgive them. That was why. So he was running because he knew that if those people repent, God will do what? Forgive them. God said, go to Nineveh. Tell them I'm going to destroy the place. God, I know you. You are a consuming fire. You are also a loving God. So if you go to Jonah chapter 4 verse 2, he now came and he prayed to God. And he said, oh God, was not this my saying when I was with you in my country? Therefore, I fled before you to touch it. Because I know you, that you are a gracious God, merciful God, slow to anger, great in kindness, and you repent of evil. I told you I don't want to go. You say go. Therefore, now, oh Lord, take my life and beseech you. I'm ashamed. He said, oh God, it's better for me to die than to live. God now said, ah, uh ah, -uh. why are you angry? Look at verse 4. Now, why are you angry now? They repented. Should I not forgive them? Don't forgive them. Because now, <laughs> now I'm ashamed. Because I went there saying, you will kill them. You will kill them. I know that you will repent if they forgive you, beg you. Now you're making me a prophet. A false prophet. I'm ashamed. That was the issue. So in his conversation with God, he was angry. And God said, Jonah, what's wrong with you? I was willing to destroy them. I knew they would repent. But I just want you to go and give them an opportunity. Hey, boy, I know you. You are merciful. If you are going to send me, please hide your mercy. Destroy them. <laughs> Do you get it? Destroy them. Why? So that they can know I'm a prophet. Why send me to prophesy and you won't do it? That's how we pastors will behave. And you people are the problem. You now say, my God did not send them. They said the Shaju will not win. Look at this person won. Jonathan will lose. You get sometimes you don't even know. We now start saying, hey, if God has sent them, how come those things they said did not happen? What if they repent? No, they must not repent. Because if God says it, they must not repent. If they repent, God should still kill them. To prove that Fela is a prophet. God should back his prophet. Back him. Kill them. Uh, so that was the issue between Jonah. Jonah did not want to go. Not because God knows. He knew that God may repent. Change. Repent means to change his mind if those people repent. That was his grounds. That was his issue. And in chapter 4, he had this conversation with God. We should not stop in chapter 2 and chapter 3. We must always read chapter 4 of the book of Jonah to understand the issue why Jonah did not want to go to Nineveh. Have I answered that one now? Is that clear? Which other one? Which other one? Clap, clap. Which other one again? I hope I have a question. I heard the fire. The one that said fire, fire. Now, the human nature is an eye for, a tooth for, that's what, that's what we pray. In most churches. That's why he said it is difficult to, to say we should pray for those that hate us. Bless those that persecute us. He said it is difficult. Oh yes! By human. But if the Holy Ghost is helping you, it is easier. But because we don't want the help of the Holy Ghost. We want to do it ourselves. Left with me. Go good out. Don't go good to me. For my Lord. That is my prayer point. But to now say, oh Lord, those you know hate you, forgive them. Not even to forgive them. To now say, Lord, bless them. Eh? Super difficult. I will not pray bless them. I will not pray curse them. I'll keep my mouth shut. But he said, no, you must pray bless them. How can you be praying for those that hate you? It doesn't make sense. It is no 
not natural. It's not normal. Because those that hate you, you secretly wish them evil. Even if you don't say it with your mouth. God, deal with them. God, deal with them. Let them know that they are uh, let me deal with them, oh Lord, deal with them, deal with them. You won't say it with your big mouth, they say deal with them, but you are whispering, God, deal with them, deal with them, Lord, let them, let them know, let them know, kill them, let them, let them have accident, let them not die fully. Let just, just take one leg, take one leg, take one hand. So when they come back to church, they're like this, in church, they're like this, fed them, fed them all, fed them all to church, so they can know that, uh, 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 you, uh, your heart is so, so wicked, the heart of man is desperately wicked. Desperately wicked, evil continually without Christ. But once Christ comes in, everything should change. So I don't understand how we can be Christians and we still act more like the world. So it means we are carnal Christians. You can't have a carnal unbeliever, you can only have a carnal Christian. Carnality means a Christian who has the mind of the world controlling his or her actions. You can't have a carnal unbeliever. You can only have a carnal believer. And you can't have a spiritual unbeliever. <laughs> eh? Eh? Oh, sorry, not, but spiritual. Mm -mm. You cannot have a spiritual unbeliever. You can't have a carnal uh, unbeliever. Unbeliever is. Christian is. But a carnal Christian is one controlled by his human nature. Still struggling, a baby in Christ. First Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. So if you have a baby pastor, they have a prayer point will be baby prayer point. Kill them. Forget how long they've been in faith. Just check the spirit of their prayer point. That's kind of Christianity. The Lord help us in Jesus. Any other questions? Put your hands together. I first any questions. Okay, okay. What one would you ask? No, 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 no. There will be a son of perdition. He chose to be the one. He chose. This, as I've said, if record, it has been written. It is written. One of the twelve will uh, betray him. Will sell him with that for thirty pieces of silver. It could have been Andrew, but the one that was greedy, the most. Satan entered his heart, and he went, and he was a treasurer. With all the money he's been stealing, it should have been enough. He wanted to steal more. To make money from the body of Christ. So he stole. And so he chose it. He, so the decision is still his own. Mary said, be it unto me according to thy word. She agreed. So what if angels are spoken to two or three that say, no, I don't want to be. It's not possible. But the one that accepted is the one that is written. Sometimes I wish God can open our eyes to see that many things that God tries on earth may not even work between one for us. We don't know it. The one that accepted that be it unto me according to thy word. I went to meet Elizabeth, her cousin, and then the baby leaped up in that one's belly when she confirmed that what you heard is from God. Because the same thing happened to me six months ago. I've been hiding here thinking, is it true? Until your voice came. Hey, so it is true. This denial is from God. Hey, 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 I've been chosen. How? Why? What did I do? So, God knows what will happen. We've got that foreknowledge. The destination, pre, before, destination or destiny. Destiny. Destiny, where we are going to. Called purposes of God. Purpose. God has proposed certain things will happen. That in this world, there will be an antichrist. Who the antichrist will be, we don't know. It's been prophesied. There will be calamities. There will be evil. Who will carry those evil out? We don't know yet. But some people will say, I will fulfill that. Why some people will feel good? So it's up to us to begin to say, Lord, I want to understand your full purposes to those that are called according to his purpose. Praise God. I think I've answered all these questions. Yeah, like four or five. Put your hands together for Jesus. I doubt if there is any other question tonight. I don't think so. In the absence of any, okay, one more. I want one from the choir so they won't say I'm, I'm biased. One more. Sister DJ Louis. Oh, yeah. Okay, thank you, Daddy. So my question is, uh, it's a bit different from today's teaching, actually. Yes. So it's in the book of Matthew 12, 31. 
And he said, uh, I, and so I tell you, I'm reading from New, New International Version. And so I tell you, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven, but blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. So my question now is that, uh, how can one sin against the Holy Spirit? What is the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost? Yes, sir. It's um, arrogating God's work to the devil. And you know it's not. Matthew chapter 12 explains it. Is that Matthew chapter 12 or Mark? No, it's Matthew, sir. Matthew 12, 31. Oh, it's Matthew's version you're reading. 12, yes, 31, exactly. Matthew chapter 12, you read previous verses. From that same verse, Jesus just cast out devils. He said he used this. He said, if I cast out devils by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Let me tell you something. All sins will be forgiven to men. But if that sins against the Holy Ghost, aha, you see, then that will not be, not, it will not be forgiven. So sinning against the Holy Ghost, blasphemy is arrogating what God is doing through this great man of God to the devil. And it's very bad. If you don't know, it's different. But you know, you're conscious of, you are giving the devil credit for God's work. And you know it. That's what, in context, we have the contextual interpretation. Now, First John chapter 4 or 5 gives us a different view about, I do not ask you to pray for the person that has uh, committed a sin unto death. So people have always linked sin unto death with uh, blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. Are they the same? Because of my time, please, I, I want to deeply explain it. Some say they are the same, some say they are not the same. I believe they are the same. Sin unto death, meaning that this sin is going to end you in eternal death, not physical death. Eternal death, you're gone. Bye bye. Shake your Because it's not necessary for you to pray against, to pray for this person anymore. Because this person has been blasphemed. Blasphemy is a very strong phrase used in those scripture days. Blasphemy. To make his blasphemous statement is to scandalize Christ. To scandalize the Christ, Christ himself and the body of Christ. To say, this is the devil working. This is, and you know it's God. And you, because you, you give credit to the devil for what God is doing. And that's why people were saying to us when Joshua Tentome was alive, I wish it's not God. What if it's God? If we now say it's the devil working, what if we are committing the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost? I said, no, it's not true. Now, that guy is the devil's servant. They asked me why. And I said it many years ago. The only condition I gave to them, is that my video? <laughs> Uh -huh. The only condition I give them all is this. Listen to me. I asked everybody that asked that care to know them. I asked them one question. Who was Joshua Temetokwe's father in the Lord? Which church did they come from? Which Sunday school did they go to? Who taught him? When did he get born again? Not one church in Nigeria can identify with him. Can you just be born again from Father's womb? Can you just jump from heaven? Boy, you become a miracle worker. Nobody. Nobody could connect to his loins or him connect to anybody. So we started to doubt its authenticity. Because everybody comes from somewhere. I know where I come from. I can tell you where all these big, big bishops come from. I can tell you this episode started in campus, then he rose up. We can almost link this everybody to somewhere. You can, nobody just wakes up when you're not Melchizedek. No father, no mother, no descent, no... You just woke up, Wah! And you're not the high priest. <laughs> Do you get the point now? So... That's why we do that. On a lighter note, let's close with this video. Ladies and gentlemen, this is why we never choose to be sing. Because, because, because you are beautiful. Your idea is good too. I can marry you. I love you very, very well. I love you, my girlfriend. I love you, my girlfriend. Oh, God. Put your hands together for Jesus. That's why I can never sing. It is not by, by force. Can this one sing? I love you. Brethren, is that singing? Put your hands together for Jesus. Rise to your feet. Actually, I can do better. Actually, I can do better than that man. Me, I'm a better singer. <laughs> Put your hands together, everybody. <laughs> Hallelujah. Just give him praise. Give your lift your voices. Give